Good afternoon. We're back now, and we're with Brian Del Monte. Not really related to the pineapples we have here in Hawaii, uh, but he's joining us from Minneapolis, and uh, he has, um, and he'll be talking about um, about the passport, vaccine passport, and uh, and specifically, where do we stand in regards to traveling and so forth? So. I leave it up to Brian to tell us a little bit about who he is and what he's doing and um, and so forth. So Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So yeah, just a brief background of who I am. So my name is Brian Del Monte. I'm the president of the Aviation Agency, and we're a full service advertising agency that works with aviation, aerospace, and defense clients around the world. Uh, I've been in, involved in tracking this issue basically since COVID began this time last year. It's really weird, right? We're at a year now of, of COVID. Um, and I took, I actually got home from my last trip that I would have taken a year ago would have been today. I was coming back from uh, a convention, an aviation convention of all things, uh, schedulers and dispatchers convention. Um, so it's been a bizarre, been a bizarre year, right? So the issue with, with the vaccine, the issue with, um, the passports, it basically revolves around a question of, uh, trust and, um, information. Okay. Um, the countries have a vested interest in ensuring that the individuals coming into their country uh, may not have, you know, a dangerous pathogen. And this is before uh, COVID. I mean, COVID highlights the current case, but it's not like we just let people into each other's countries without having a sense of, of their health status. With most of the world's travel, we become spoiled because most of the pathogens in the world don't represent a systemic risk to the hospitals and emergency rooms of each other's countries, right? And in most of the world, uh, we have strong inoculations against measles and mumps and rubella and tetanus and diphtheria and you know, all these other diseases. Um, so we don't really think about it, right? If I go to, to uh, another country, I'm not really that worried that I'm going to encounter those viruses or, or, or maladies. And they're not too worried about uh, uh, when people come here. Well, that's all changed now with COVID, right? And we shut down borders and we shut down um, basically people going anywhere. The only thing really moving around the world right now are goods. So as we vaccinate, the question that everyone's trying to answer is how are we going to verify that individuals coming into the country have received a vaccine that is generally perceived by the country allowing the person to come in as being safe and effective. And therefore that individual probably doesn't represent a strong risk of either um, you know, spreading COVID or contracting COVID, right? And so the idea of the vaccine passport is going to be, I'll present you some sort of credential that says, here I am, I've been vaccinated, you know, I'm good. Uh, but obviously there's vast differences country to country uh, as to how that's being documented. And so ultimately there are all these challenges just associated in presenting each other credentials. Um, in many ways, it's like the way it was before we kind of like standardized visas and passports, you know, sometime in the, in the eighties, early nineties, because we got, tired. I mean, you know, now you're lucky if they stamp your passport, let alone put in a visa, right. right? You know, now that's the triumph of standardizing everything and everybody really getting an understanding as to risk. So, so we're, we're kind of back to square one on COVID. Uh, but, you know, ultimately the problem we're trying to solve is making sure that you coming to the United States or me coming to somebody else, you know, to France, isn't going to represent a pathological uh, biohazard risk. That's what we're yeah. trying to solve here. Yeah, it's it's really the to have a vaccine passport is not something new. Right. You all remember, you'll probably remember, and I still have one of this, the yellow um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, put in your passport for yellow fever and malaria and other issues. 
So yes. this has been around for 100 years. So it, yes. it's not really new, but we're, we're moving on in technology. Now we have chips on our passports right. that are internationally recognized. Right. The, the, the vaccine, of course, is very new. We don't know where the vaccine goes, how effective it eventually is. I can tell you, we're just working on a breaking story in, uh, today, and you can see it later on on, on Etobo News in regards to Seychelles. Uh, Seychelles, very small country, 98,000 people. Everyone got vaccinated. All of a sudden, they have an enormous spike in COVID cases, and they're all from people who are already vaccinated. Now it needs to be seen. Will any of these people be hospitalized? So far, no one is hospitalized. So we don't know where we're going. Then we have the situation in the UK that, uh, or in with the Chinese um, uh, vaccine, uh, the United Arab Emirates that used also the Chinese vaccine among others now has to give booster shots to everyone who had this vaccine. So having the vaccine may not be 100% security <clears throat> in regards not um, having the virus or contracting the virus. So we're, we're still learning. And this is probably the same, I would think, with the passport. There, there have been some countries, like in, if you go back to the Seychelles or to some of the uh, smaller countries that rely on the travel and tourism industry, they say, okay, we're going to let everyone in, but you have to show us you're vaccinated. Once they said this, people are come, some people are coming back into their country going on vacation, and it some turns out their documents are, are false. Right. We had three people arrested in on the island of Kauai here in Hawaii, not with false passports, obviously they're not around, uh, or uh, vaccination passports, but with false certificates uh, for having received the test they didn't never receive. So, right. and how do you, if you really want to do it, I think there are two issues. One, how do you uniformly make this acceptable? This should be something the United Nations, specifically UNWTO, in this case, and the World Health Organization should get involved in. And I don't know if they are. I'd be, I'd be surprised if they are. And, and secondly, what about privacy concerns? Do we are now going to have a society of two different type of uh, groups of people, one that are allowed to travel and the other ones they cannot travel? How do you see this? Well, you raise there. There's a lot to to unpack there. So let's let's take let's right. take a few of the boxes. Okay. So so first, um, is this an international problem? Yes. Okay. So there are many layers to be involved, and um, but I feel pretty confident that the existing framework of international institutions is sufficient to address COVID. Okay, uh, you know, we addressed AIDS, we addressed SARS, we addressed smallpox, you know, etc. Okay, and as you pointed out with yellow fever and malaria and whatnot, by the way, you still need to carry those cards if you're traveling right. to certain parts of the world. But if I'm again, we become spoiled. If I go to Britain, passport control in Britain is going to be like, show us all your inoculations. Why? Because there's widespread inoculation in the United States and there's widespread inoculation in Britain. So the risk profile, it's like, yeah, we can ask each other's nationals about all that, but is it really necessary? Yeah, probably not. Now with COVID, as you pointed out, there's a lot of challenges there. One is, is that the, 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 the data, um, you know, seems to be pretty easy to replicate. Right. I mean, I've seen the inoculation cards. Granted, this is my field. We produce art for a living, but I could make a card in a day. I could make right. one that would pass, you know, would look just like everything else. So these are not particular, you know, this is not like money where it's hard to counterfeit mm -hmm. it. Right. Right. But that said, the issue is not so much the physical um, presentment as it is this system to be able to robustly verify. Okay, so as you've pointed out on our passport cards, we have chips and all this. That's all after 9-11, okay? And that was all negotiated by the United States, uh, you know, as the, the world's dominant superpower, okay? We were like, look, if you want to come to the United States, you got to play by our rules. And so as a result, every country was, was um, asked to change how it conducted its passport identification. 
All right. And so now everybody's passport looks like America passports. Okay. Now, granted, there was negotiation in international institutions, you know, et cetera. But, you know, same thing's going to have to happen here. Um, there needs to be some discussions about, well, let's say, for example, I get the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which now many countries are stopping. But let's say I've been inoculated with that. Is the United States going to accept that vaccine, assuming that at the time an individual attempts to enter, that vaccine continues to be not recognized by the Food and Drug Administration as being safe and effective? That would be an interesting discussion that you probably don't want to have at the airport with the customs office. Right. right so right. you need to know in advance is it going to be good enough so all those questions have to get resolved and i suspect the united states will need to take a leading role uh and there's been quite a change in administrations you know from and this is not a political statement this is just an observational statement that president trump took essentially what i would call an autarkic view of international politics figure it out yourself we're going to do whatever we want and Joe Biden is a neo-institutionalist. So he takes a completely different approach from that. And he's like, nope, we're going to work together. We've got institutions. We're going to use the WHO. We're going to use this. We're going to use that. Okay. So it only works if everybody agrees that when I present my credentials, you understand them. You have a way of knowing they're valid. And you have a way of processing the information I'm giving you. Otherwise, there's no point, right? Everyone can't have their own slip of paper that says, oh, well, here it is, right? Because right. that's not how this works. So that'll all get figured out. So there's, there's that aspect of it. Now, the other question then becomes the data privacy question. And that is the one that is stickiest, both for the United States and for most of the industrialized world, but particularly the United States. And that's because we in this country with the constitution, with federal law and, and, and uh, you know, with Supreme Court interpretation of that law, there is a right of privacy and it is a fundamental right. There is a right of travel and it is a fundamental right. And so you can't just willy nilly, you know, do stuff. So Congress is gonna have to play a role here to determine how that data is going to be handled, what data can be collected, what individuals need to know, you know, now we're in such a hurry to get jabs into people's arms that right now we're kind of using our existing system of it's between you and your doctor and it's, be, you know, you're getting your little card and all that stuff, right? Well, if we're going to be transmitting this information, you know, it takes me back to my days of when I was with the Pentagon. When I would go to another country as a U.S. government official, I had to get clearances to enter that country. I couldn't just waltz in like when I was Brian Del Monte tourist. Okay. As a government official, I couldn't just walk in. I had to get clearances. They had to know I was coming. They would ask, has he been inoculated? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those things. Right. Um, you know, does, you know, and when I was traveling as an official of the government, I really didn't need to worry about visas or anything because I was traveling under diplomatic authority. But my point is, is there was much more of a robust exchange between the United States and that host country when I was coming in. Well, I may see, we may see that applied to everyone. And so you may be prompted to produce information that you've been, you've been vaccinated when and how, and uh, uh, that data is going to need to be controlled under some set of arrangements that all countries agreed to. I'm less worried about inoculations because what we're talking about is, okay, Brian got the Pfizer vaccine on March 15th. Okay, great. That doesn't really give you much in the way of like personal identifiable information or privacy issues, right? Or, or someone actually more worried about, okay, so what else is on there? Like when was the last time I was tested? Um, when they take the test, yeah, they can do a COVID test. They can also do all kinds of other tests with a saliva and nasal, you know, swab, right? And I'm not being conspiracy minded in saying that. I'm just saying there is that, that uh, door that's open there that has to get resolved. In this country, it's gonna primarily need to be resolved by Congress. 
And Outlook isn't exactly the best because they can't even agree amongst themselves to all get vaccinated. <laughs> okay, they have a complete supply so that every member of Congress can get vaccinated and like a third of them refuse to do so and they refuse to tell anyone whether or not they've been vaccinated. Okay, so it's disheartening to say the least that we expect this group is gonna figure out what we should do for everyone, right? Now, the Biden administration is like, well, we should look at vaccine passports for people to travel within the United States. Okay. Uh, I think that's a, a, my suspicion is the primary motivation behind that is actually to, com to, to incentivize and to a certain extent compel people to get vaccinated because they want to increase the amount of vaccination in the United States. I don't think it's really the case of you're going to have to show a card to get into, I don't know, Missouri at the airport, because there would be, I think, quite logistic, you know, realistically and, and, and quite legitimately challenges to that under our laws. So, you know, the privacy issue is not inconsequential. It's probably the biggest problem that we're gonna to have to chew through. Uh, and here's the other thing. It's not just for, I mean, raise your hand if you think this is gonna be the last pandemic we deal with. We've had two pandemics in the last you know, 15 years, right? We had SARS, which freaked everyone out. Part of the reason why we have these vaccines is because of SARS, mm -hmm. okay? And we've had COVID. So something else is ine you know, inevitably going to come down the pike. So one of the questions for countries is, is, okay, there's the immediate case at hand of COVID, but how are we going to deal with pathogens as a systemic risk in a globalized environment? That's got to get worked out. Yeah, and it's, of course, it's not only about the United States. I mean, if you look at other countries, look at the European Union. The European mm -hmm. Union cannot even figure out how they can control travel within their own extended borders and you're looking look at africa um, africa has other challenges besides uh, COVID in, in like the ebola outbreak in the democratic republic of congo and the border to uganda what again falls into the travel and tourism industry because uganda for a lot of parts is, is dependent on on travel and tourism and then also tourists coming in from from other areas so it right. really needs an international approach if we wanted this passport. If right. we didn't want the uh, didn't want this passport, what is the alternative? Because if every country, as you said, has an interest in keeping its citizens safe. If you just look here at our state where I'm at in Hawaii, um, we currently have the lowest numbers in the United States by far, the lowest number percentage-wise, um, because you cannot really compare numbers with numbers but percentage wise and I, I think a big reason is because we have been restricting arrivals into the states and we're an mm -hmm. island of course we have an advantage mm -hmm. now there are many other islands not and some of them are independent countries like Palau like the U.S. like the Seychelles we mentioned Mauritius where right. you can see that COVID is less of an issue but in other islands, it's an enormous issue because if, once it gets in, it's really hard to get out. Right. And and as you rightfully say, it's all about the capacity also in in the healthcare and in, in hospitals. So maybe there will be um, a COVID passport that has different kind of categories depending on the vaccine you get. And I don't know where this all would go to. I mean, obviously, you can probably find a chip and implant it into your forehead. That's going to be quite safe, uh, but I'm just joking. Obviously, we don't want that, but that might be coming. Who knows? You know, and I'm I'm just wondering, how do you think? If you look at the international institutions, you said they're there. We have the World Health Organization. Um, in the tourism part, we have the United Nations World Tourism Organization. And when you really look specifically at UNWTO, now we've been following UNWTO for many years, ever since. They had a leadership change in 2018. To be honest with you, and everyone who reads us knows my opinion, they're useless. So I don't expect anything from them. So now there's the private sector. Private sector, you have the World Travel and Tourism Council. They're a membership organization. Their members are the largest 
uh, companies in travel and tourism, like the Marriott and American Express, and they seem to be more effective also actually talking to government. Then there is us also with the World Tourism Network trying to take care of the smaller and medium guys. It's going to be an enormous task to bring all of this together and uh, come up with some kind of a mechanism so actually the travel and tourism industry can relaunch not only safely, but efficiently, don't you think so? Yeah, I do. Here's where I suspect um, where we probably differ. The, the core of these activities, I would argue, are, as a former policy guy, I would argue these are inherently governmental functions. Okay, who, who gets to go where, immigration. I mean, we may not think of traveling to a country for tourism as immigration, but it is, okay? These are all inherently governmental activities. So I find it highly unlikely that non-governmental actors will play a determinative role as a result, okay? Now, as you pointed out with the European Union, with the Schengen area, that is all intergovernmental. That's also inherently governmental. And they've made their decision on that through international treaty, right? And, and so, you know, the idea was with the Schengen that they would be transparent within each country of the member states, but they would, you know, essentially control themselves collectively against the rest of the world. Well, under COVID, it's presented a challenge, hasn't it? <laughs> okay. Right. So, so I really believe, you know, I'm talking about Hawaii, all right, talking about Hawaii, uh, Governor Cuomo is currently in hot water, but for me, um, <laughs> his, the thing that he did, you know, apparently, I guess he may not be the nicest guy, but but the issue for me was, was when he was like, well, we're going to be checking everyone that enters the state of New York. And if your license plate is from Missouri, well, you have to be quarantined. Okay. Completely a violation of constitutional law. Right. Okay. That is, and what Hawaii did, completely a violation of constitutional law. Okay. That's my position. It may be unpopular. Right. I understand it worked. Okay. Congress has the sole and plenary power to regulate interstate commerce. And that includes people moving across state borders. And the framers actually had this discussion about who gets to decide what. And it's on Congress. Okay. So any vaccine passports or whatever, they're going to keep people in or out or whatever, that has to go through Congress. There's no way for states to do this on their own. There is no way for political actors that are non-governmental entities. Now, they will most certainly in, okay, they will. There is a role for them to play. It's not the determinative role. In the end, and what I'm drawing on, you know, as a former political scientist essentially is this. You have a crisis, World War I, World War II, you know, SARS, COVID. And so the international community attempts to react to that stimulus. And it builds all kinds of institutions and reactions to it. So like the UN, the WHO, the IMF, the World Bank, Bretton Woods, you know, all these things were all response to World War I and II. Well, we're going to have a whole bunch of institutional responses as a result of COVID. Because short of a nuclear exchange, I can't imagine an event that would cause more damage to the global economy than COVID did. Right. It's like $25 trillion and counting. Okay, in terms of the amount of, of damage that was done. So there's going to be an institutional response to this. NGOs will play a role. And this may sound pigheaded on my part. I don't mean it to be. The United States, especially with Biden as president, is likely to take the lead and determinative role as to what that regime looks like for two reasons. One, we're probably the only ones able to pay for it. And two, we're the ones that have the leverage in order to bring this multilateral problem to a solution at the table. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real you know, pickle for the new incoming State Department and for the United States that deal with, but it's probably going to be incumbent upon us 
to ultimately sort this out. Again, and it's not to say that the European Union won't play a role or that our allies won't play a role, they will. And the first set of agreements is probably gonna be between the United States and Canada, and then the United States and Mexico and South America, and then the United States and Europe. All three of those things are probably gonna get worked out right about at the same time, especially as everyone gets vaccinated because that's most of the places we want to go. So we want to sort it out, right? So there's a strong incentive. But I just don't believe, A, that a Marriott or a Delta Airlines or whatnot should be the ones that drive the train on this, nor do I think they're in a position to even if they wanted to. These are inherent governmental activities. There needs to be a policy debate. There needs to be law that gets debated. There needs to be input from the body politic into that process. Otherwise, it won't have legitimacy. Yeah, and of course, the private sector, there's the lobbying, of course. You lobby the government. Yeah, they'll influence. To, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think we both agree on this part. Maybe we disagree on the Hawaii part. And uh, I, I have to say, um, and I'm, I'm not a big friend of our local government, people know this, but um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm have absolutely no objection of being safe. And I feel safe living here because I know uh, we're doing everything we can to keep it out. And the jurisdiction, of course, is an issue. Yes, the federal government has jurisdiction over uh, interstate commerce, um, who, what planes can operate or not operate. It's all up to the feds. But right. the state should have a responsibility. Who can get into your state? In the city, maybe who can get into your city in a in a health emergency, and that's really how it was set up here. And there yeah, was no, and, I, yeah. and I get and I get that I do. Okay, and the, the and I'm not looking to go deep into the weeds on this. Right, it is not like this is the first time a pandemic has affected the United States, and it's not like there isn't Supreme Court decisions about what states can and can't do, and what cities can or can't do. The challenge with COVID versus other public health crises that we've had is a person could be sick with COVID and look healthy to you and me. Right. Whereas in the past, those who are sick demonstrate what are called phenotypical characteristics. You can look at them and go, they ain't looking so hot, right? So it's a lot easier to discriminate <laughs> against people who are sick versus everyone stay home. Now, you know, curious thing though, as you point out, look, I'm not in favor of this, but I complied with it. That pretty much happened all across the United States. I'd say a lot of the stay-at-home orders, if truly challenged in litigation, that most of them probably wouldn't survive review. And as a matter of fact, those that were severely challenged didn't, okay? Many of us just took it in stride and were like, look, this is a, this is a really crappy situation, but we all kind of got to do our thing. And so we abided by travel restrictions that probably weren't straight up legal. And we abided by, you know, uh, stay at home orders that probably weren't within the power of governors because none of us, you know, what, what the prospect of all of us were freaked out about was, is a simple act of going to the movies could kill you. Right. Right. And so, and you didn't know, you know, before it happened, am I going to be fine or am I going to be dead? Right. And even you now, know, two like, weeks later. You know, right. That's... Right. That's right. Right. And so in that circumstance, see, this is why the, this is why there's going to need to be an institutional response to this because of that fact. Um, since you don't know if simple activities could wind up being um, uh, deadly, this is why people so negatively react to the groups that won't wear masks. Right. This is why everyone's like so binary, hot and cold on this issue, and there's no common ground. So when you look at countries, right, just simple countries like the United States and Canada. OK, quick little historical fact that is the longest, both in terms of time and in terms of distance, unguarded border between two countries in history. We are not allowing each other's citizens to cross at the moment, <laughs> okay? First time ever that's been the case, right. okay? Why? Because of COVID, okay? Now, if we're going to get around that, we have to have confidence that the risk profile for each country is more or less identical. So when Canada gets its vaccine rates up 
and you know, let's say Canada is at like 70, 80%, the United States is at 70 or 80%, there's probably not going to be a lot of interest in, in a vaccine passport for country, you know, for our citizens to go back and forth. So this is something that's probably going to be most heavily used at the beginning to try to keep people safe so that hospitals don't wind up overwhelmed, so that the infrastructure doesn't wind up overwhelmed, so that these, um, yeah, I hadn't heard about the Seychelles thing, uh, but uh, there is a real risk that uh, the variants may reinfect those who have been infected with both, you know, I guess, organic COVID and the vaccines. So, you know, there's a lot we don't know. But the idea is they're trying just desperately to open things up, right? But then there's this a information asymmetry problem. How do I know that you coming into my country won't kill people? That's the question effectively we're yeah. trying to solve. Yeah, and you have like two huge powers. One is the economic hardship people go right. through. And I can, again, living in Hawaii, where we depend on travel and tourism, except for the military business, um, for the most part, I mean, there are heartbreaking stories of people who've stayed in business. I know these people who run this restaurant for three generations, they're out of business. Right. Uh, shopping malls are deserted. Uh, during the hard times, you can go through Waikiki, Kalakaua Avenue, you can pretty much sleep on the middle of the main road and won't get hit by a car. So Right. The situation is not easy uh, for people. That's right. And and to keep calm and to really um, find a solution, I, I think um, everyone in this country, even though with um, two polarized opinions, sometimes um, are, are doing a fairly good job in not panicking. And we need to probably keep the pool also when it comes to developing a mechanism, what, what definitely could be this international a travel passport in a way. And uh, yes, I agree with you, the United States would probably take a leading role, maybe together with the EU um, on this uh, to, to see where this goes. But it has been a fascinating discussion, I have to say, and, and we would love to continue this. And, and um, as I said uh, before we went on the air, if you wanted to join the World Tourism Network, I would encourage you, maybe this could be a whole discussion for network members. Uh, to, to have, and, and we cover both the private sector and a lot of the public sector around the world, and I'm, I'm sure everyone is interested um, in your expert opinion here, and uh, <laughs> maybe if we <laughs> all put our, put our head together, maybe we, we can come up with good suggestions that are adopted by the powers to be uh, to solve, solve this issue. Well, I appreciate you having me on, um, and it was a uh, fascinating discussion. I hope it's uh, of value to viewers. No, I, I think uh, everyone is enjoying this because we're all looking forward to travel again. I can say I'm getting my my vaccine shot uh, hopefully on Wednesday, and awesome. I already I'm already have my flights booked to attend the World Travel and Tourism Council conference in Cancun the end of the month, and after this in Dubai, the Arabian travel market. So we're going to. At World Tourism Network, we're uh, partnering with both. We're really looking forward in meeting people. Hopefully, everyone is vaccinated who gets there. Um, but we, we need to we need to somehow restart this business, but in a safe way. It makes absolutely no sense in just starting uh, in travel because of the travel sake without um, knowing what the consequences are. But uh, absolutely, and and that's why I think everyone agrees. The vaccine is a major step forward and hopefully we can keep it like this. I think so too. Well, good luck in your travels and good luck with the vaccine. Yes, and 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 build a snow a snowman. Yes. And, <laughs> I know, I know it's it definitely snowing, is snowing pretty good here right now. Yeah, it's unusual. Everyone thinks of Minneapolis always is snowing, but it actually is today looking out my window. Well, maybe I'll go surfing after this to see what happens. <laughs> I'd rather okay. be in Hawaii than here. So have All a great right. afternoon. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Beaches is all about families, and keeping your family safe is our number one priority. That's why we created our Platinum Protocol of Cleanliness, setting a new standard of excellence in health and safety protocols to give you a worry-free destination wedding of a lifetime. Beaches was built on connection. Connecting with family and friends, celebrating old times, and creating new beginnings. 
And we know the love you have for your family and having them there for the most special time of your life is what's most important. At Beaches, you can still have that happily ever after with a fully customized destination wedding surrounded by the people who mean the most to you. You can feel safe saying, I do, in a lush tropical garden. Or walking down a white sand aisle with a calm blue sea as your backdrop. Our wedding venues are found in wide open spaces, nature made for celebrating your love. And while we've always led the industry in health and safety protocols, our resorts are even safer now than ever, giving you a wedding free of worries, surrounded by love. That's why we've reduced the capacity of our venues and put more physical distance between guests. Instead of tables for eight at your reception, we'll seat only six guests per table. We've eliminated buffets and specialty food stations, so all food will be plated and served by Beach's staff wearing masks. We're even offering live stream service of your wedding ceremony so your friends and family who can't travel right now can still share in your special day. Once the vows have been exchanged, the honeymoon of a lifetime begins. And we're taking every measure necessary to ensure your health and safety during your stay at Beaches. As part of the Sandals Resort's family, we've followed in their footsteps in setting a new standard of excellence with our Platinum Protocol of Cleanliness. Together with the extensive research from local ministries and health officials, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, Beaches has instituted advanced hygiene practices across 18 key touch points a triple check system that includes inspecting, cleaning, and sanitizing hard surfaces and common areas every 20 minutes, adding auto-dispensing hand sanitizing stations throughout the resort. To ensure the utmost safety, beaches will be using hospital-grade disinfectants, electrostatic sprayers for advanced cleaning, UV lighting equipment to inspect cleanliness, and air duct sanitization for each room before every guest's arrival. We've gone so far as to steam clean and sanitize carpeting and flooring prior to arrivals and placing personal hand sanitizers in every guest room. For added safety, all staff members are required to wear protective face gear at all times. And from now on, guests can check in online at home so they can bypass the front desk and go directly to their rooms. Stricter physical distancing protocols have also been put in place in every part of the resort. Chlorine and pH levels at all our pools and water parks are monitored every two hours. And we've taken added measures to protect the health and safety of your family. Our kids' camps facilities are sanitized before and after each use. And all of our professional nannies carry pocket-sized bottles of hand sanitizer. Our tween and teen hangouts, including the Xbox Play Lounge and Trench Town, are sanitized before and after each use with hospital-grade disinfectants. In addition, all our spa facilities and sports equipment will be sanitized before and after use to protect the health and safety of our guests and their families. Both Sandals and Beaches are committed to providing strict compliance and implementation of these safety protocols, so much so that we've created a dedicated quality inspection team at each resort to make sure all safety measures are adhered to. We can't wait to help you make your dreams come true with a destination wedding at Beaches. And while you're focused on your new life together, surrounded by those you love the most, we'll take care of everything else.